I think it can be safely said that we live in a society centered on success. Our world honors and rewards high achievement. Trophies, medals, plaques, awards, certificates, all of these are given to those who stand out amongst the crowd. And the accumulation of awards and honors begins at a young age, really in high school, as students begin trying to outdo other applicants with their grades and their extracurricular activities and their community service projects, all in an effort to try to, be, to get accepted into the college of their choice. We live in a credential conscious culture. And most of us understand the value and importance placed on credentials because having the right credentials, the right achievements can give you access to people and opportunities that would have been unattainable otherwise. Accomplishments and credentials are often viewed as our ticket to the good life. And there's nothing wrong with hard work and striving for excellence and pushing yourself to do your very best. Those are noble and praiseworthy qualities and we want to encourage them in our, in our friends and in family and children. The problem comes when people begin to believe that earthly success and spiritual achievements are our ticket to heaven. That God will somehow be impressed with or even obligated to throw open the gates of heaven to us because we flashed our credentials and read through our list of accomplishments. Now, as we continue in our study through the New Testament book of Philippians today, we're beginning chapter 3 this morning. And Paul turns his attention now to protecting the gospel's purity. Protecting the gospel's purity. And he is going to give the Philippian church an essential and urgent warning to protect the purity of the gospel message. And here's why. As Paul traveled from town to town, he shared the gospel message with anyone and everyone who would listen. He told them that being forgiven and reconciled to God the Father is now available to everyone because Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Jesus has paid the penalty for our sin and God's judgment can be removed and we can be reconciled to the Father. And whoever puts their trust in the sacrificial work of Jesus rather than in their own achievements or human success, they will be saved and they'll be brought out of the kingdom of darkness and ushered into the kingdom of light. Paul shared this message everywhere he went to anyone who would listen to him. And through this message, people in every town were being saved. And, and Paul would start churches, just like he had done in Philippi 10 years prior to writing the letter that we're studying now. He had started that little church in Philippi. But oftentimes, oftentimes, a group of people from Jerusalem called Judaizers, would wait for Paul to leave town, keep their eye on him. And as soon as he left town, they would come in and begin to infiltrate the church and begin to lead these new believers astray with false teaching. They would come into this new little church to these new believers and they would say, well, we're from Jerusalem and we have come, just wanted you to know that Paul's teaching is incomplete. He hasn't told you everything. In addition to faith in Jesus, to really be saved, I mean, if you really want to be saved, if you're really serious about that, then you must also be circumcised. You must also follow the law of Moses. And you must adhere to the additional rules and regulations given to us by the, Jerusalem, by the Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem. Now, you have to understand many of these believers in the Philippian church were Gentiles and they were completely unfamiliar with Jewish customs and laws. And so you can imagine 
if Paul left having shared the gospel and then the Judaizers came in and told them this, you can imagine how terribly confusing and upsetting and divisive this would be in the church. It would be a huge setback and undermine the ministry of that local church. And we don't know if the Judaizers had arrived in Philippi yet, but given the historical trend, Paul reasoned it was only a matter of time and the purity of the gospel was at stake. And so in this passage that we're looking at this morning, Paul is going to warn the church in Philippi so that they could take preventative measures and prepare themselves for this. And friends, his warning to them is also a warning to us. Christ Community Church must also be on the alert to protect against any distortions that might creep into our gospel message. So this morning, we're going to work our way through this passage together and see what the Lord would want to teach all of us together. So we're going to start by looking at verses 1 through 3. And in verses 1 through 3, Paul gives a strong warning. He gives a strong warning to the Philippian church. Look at these opening verses. It says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God and who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. I'm going to pause there. Paul begins in verse 1 by instructing the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord, reminding them that the foundation of their joy is always in the Lord and what He has done for us not in our circumstances and not in our accomplishments, not in our list of credentials. And Paul reminds them of this because he is about to make a solid case that our salvation is rooted in the work of Christ alone. And it is not dependent in any way on our human efforts or achievement. All of our rejoicing, Paul says, all of our rejoicing is to be anchored in the person and work of Christ. And Paul doesn't mind one bit taking the time to remind them of these fundamental truths. He says, it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it's a safeguard for you. See, Paul had taught these truths to the Philippians previously, most likely when he had visited with them in person. But now he needs to reiterate and remind them again in writing. And he is happy to do so because this will be a safeguard for them. Paul's writing to them will offer the Philippian church kind of another layer, the next level of protection against the crafty lies and the smooth, deceptive teaching of the Judaizers. Now in verse 2, Paul gives a powerful warning against the Judaizers, beginning with the word beware, or what our text translates, watch out for. This is a strong word. It's a military word, and it calls for a person to defend against the attack of an enemy. Be on your guard, Paul is saying. Watch out. And Paul uses it three times in this verse. It actually reads this way, watch out for those dogs, watch out for those men who do evil, watch out for those mutilators of the flesh. Three times he tells them to beware. Just as a father wants to protect his children from harm, so Paul wants to protect his spiritual children. So be on the lookout, he says. Know where these people are and know what they are doing. And do not follow them and do not imitate them. And then to intensify his warning, Paul describes these uh, false teachers with three phrases. And each of these phrases has kind of a, a double meaning. It's kind of a double entendre. Paul is using kind of a play on words to drive home his point about being on guard. 
First, he says, he describes the false teachers as dogs. And when Paul uses this word, we have to understand that uh, he was not thinking of dogs like we do. It wasn't some cute, cuddly household pet named Fifi, right? It's not dogs in that culture were dirty, mangy, and they were aggressive. They would attack. They were scavengers. They were flea-infested, disease-ridden predators. This was a word of contempt and disgust. And this is exactly, the word dogs is exactly what the Jews called the Gentiles. They called them dogs and they would spit when they said the word. But now Paul, he turns it around and he says, these Jewish false teachers are the real dogs. They are the predators. They are the scavengers. They're the ones preying on new churches and innocent believers. And so beware of them. Paul says, watch out for them. They're dogs. Next, Paul says, these men, these are men who do evil. Some of your Bibles use the word evil workers. Beware of evil workers. And this, is, this play on words has a little bit of irony tied into it because these false teachers were advocating a salvation that required good works. That circumcision and keeping the law were required if a person wanted to merit heaven someday. These teachers were teaching a Jesus plus good works plan of salvation. Jesus plus good works, which is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it will not bring people to salvation. Here's, here's the play on words. You'll hear it now. Adding good works to the gospel made these teachers evil workers. You hear that play on words? Adding good works to the gospel made them evil workers. Salvation, friends, always has been and always will be by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It is a Jesus plus nothing plan. Jesus plus nothing. And adding anything else to it is altogether evil. It's evil. Third, Paul calls them mutilators of the flesh. Mutilators of the flesh. See, these false teachers were coming into the new church and they were telling the Gentile believers that salvation was not possible without circumcision. That their salvation depended in part upon this physical ritual. And Paul was enraged. He was incensed to demand the cutting of the flesh when it's not truly required is not just cruel, it is unconscionable. Paul says. These men are mutilators. They're requiring cuts that aren't needed. Castrators is actually the word he uses. And so Paul warned the Philippian church, these false teachers are predators and mutilators and altogether evil. Beware of them. Watch out for them and make your stand against them. Do not follow them or listen to their teaching. In verse 3, by way of contrast, Paul stays on this theme of circumcision, but he says to the Philippians, if they want to talk about circumcision, then I'll say we are the true circumcision. It is we who are the true circumcision because we have trusted in Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul would say by repentance and faith, our hearts have been circumcised. And in his letter to the Romans, Paul explained this a little bit more. He said to the Romans, a person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart performed by the Holy Spirit. Do you see? You see, it's not circumcision of the flesh that matters. It's circumcision of the heart. And in this verse, Paul says, 
We are the true circumcision. We are the genuine believers. And the, and the true circumcision people are identified by three distinct qualities. Three qualities. First, he says, that these true believers worship by the Spirit of God. You'll know them because they worship by the Spirit of God. And when Paul talks about worship, he's not talking just about singing worship songs on Sunday mornings. He means he's referring to having a wholehearted devotion to the Lord, a heart that's fully surrendered to God. True believers, he would write later, true believers are not conformed to this world, but they're transformed by the renewing of their mind so that each day they live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. When Paul says that they worship by the Spirit of God, he means their daily living is an expression of worship fueled by the Holy Spirit. That's, how, that's a mark. You'll know true believers because that's true of them. Second, he says genuine believers glory in Christ Jesus. They glory in Christ Jesus. In other words, they do not boast in their human efforts or their status or their talents or their achievements. They do not flash their credentials around. Instead, true believers focus on the cross and they boast in the work that, that Jesus has finished. We are redeemed because of the sacrifice Jesus made, not because of anything that we have done for ourselves. And anything that we do for the kingdom in the days ahead is only accomplished because of the work that God is doing in us. True believers are easily identified because they glory in Christ Jesus. They boast only in Jesus. And then third, Paul says, the other mark of them they will stand out because they put no confidence in the flesh. True, genuine believers put no confidence in the flesh. And here's the truth, friends. We all put our confidence in something. We all put our confidence in something. The Judaizers were putting their confidence in their achievements, in their circumcision, in their efforts to keep the law. Given their awards and trophies, they were they were so convinced that God would throw open the gates of heaven to them. And the Apostle Paul said, it's not about that. Genuine believers put no confidence in human efforts. None. He would later write to a disciple named Titus, and he would say, it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. To the church in Ephesus, he would say, salvation is not by works so that no one can boast. And so as you can see from Paul's intensity in these few verses, he is deeply concerned about the potential of false teachers coming to Philippi and undermining the gospel he had preached there. Paul has had to contend with this group of people before, a number of times, actually. Acts chapter 15 tells about it. The whole letter of Galatians is about it. And he refers to it several times in his letters throughout the New Testament. This wasn't the first encounter with the Judaizers. But because of the potential damage, Paul gives this strong warning because he wants the believers in Philippi to be prepared. Now, in verses 4 through 7... Paul lists his credentials and calls them worthless. He lists his credentials and calls them worthless. Look at these verses with me. He says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider it loss for the sake of Christ. See, in an effort to persuade and impress these new believers in each town, this group of Judaizers would come in and brag about their accomplishments. 
They would boast about their circumcision and how well they could keep the law and how much they had memorized. They would boast about their education and what rabbi they had been mentored under. You get the idea. And they would flash these credentials around in front of the new believers, trying to intimidate them and overwhelm them. And Paul didn't want the Philippians to be intimidated or overwhelmed or even impressed by all of that. So Paul says to the Philippians, if the Judaizers want a credential showdown, I'm game for that. In verse 4, he basically says, if salvation were a matter of human credentials and achievement, I would have more confidence than any of those guys. I can beat anything they put on the table. And so in verse 5, he begins to list them. Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day, which means Paul was not a proselyte, meaning he had converted to Judaism when he was an adult. No, no, no. He was a Jew by birth and had been circumcised on the eighth day of life, according to the law of Moses. He said, I'm of the people of Israel. Paul was part of the chosen people of God, a descendant of Abraham. He said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, a tribe distinguished in Israelite history for a couple of different reasons, not the least of which because the very first king of Israel, King Saul, was from the tribe of Benjamin. Paul says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. That means Paul was full-blooded Hebrew, born to two fully Hebrew parents. In a way, you could say Paul was purebred in God's country. And then in regards to the law, Paul says he was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were kind of this morally smug group of men who believed that their obedience to the Mosaic law was far superior to everybody else's. And they loved their rules. They loved them so much so that they created additional rules and commands and then forced everybody to try and live by them. And when it came to the law, Paul said, I was a Pharisee. I kept the law Uh, scrupulously. And if that weren't enough, I mean, at this point we're kind of thinking, okay, Paul, we get it. But if that weren't enough, Paul goes on in verse 6 and he says, as for zeal, I persecuted the church. You have to understand Paul's passion and sincere love for the traditions of Judaism that he grew up with led him to persecute the church of Christ as it started. How much more zeal could a person have than that? No Judaizer was ever going to be able to boast that they had traveled hundreds of miles in order to find Christians and hunt them down and bring them back in chains to Jerusalem and seek the death sentence for them. Paul was the one who held the coats of those who stoned Stephen. How much more zeal could a person have? Paul had unsurpassed zeal. And then he says, as for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. Paul could confidently point to his stellar moral performance and his exemplary obedience to the law. If awards were ever given for Pharisee of the month, Paul's trophy case would have been overflowing. You have to understand, Paul's list of credentials, these things that he identified, these would have been the envy of any Jewish person in his day. In regards to heritage and ethnicity, rule keeping, traditions, morality, and zeal, Paul outranked every competitor. No one really could hold a candle to him. If anyone had superior credentials to flash around, it was Paul. It was Paul. But, but, Paul refused to trust his credentials. Look again at verse 7. It says, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Paul's list of credentials had built up to this impressive crescendo, but with one swipe, he dismissed them all as garbage. They're just garbage. Friends, please hear me say this this morning. When it came to the salvation of his soul and walking with the Lord each day, Paul's credentials counted for exactly nothing. 
nothing. And the same is true for you and me. And he considered all of them as loss, as a liability. And so should we. When Paul encountered Christ that, on, that day on the dusty road leading to Damascus, his former life of Judaism and all the trophies and awards and uh, accomplishments that he had accumulated, and it was a lot, it all became worthless to Paul. In that moment, Paul realized no amount of law-keeping, no amount of self-improvement, no amount of religious effort could ever make him right with God. Only Jesus could. Centuries later, another man would capture that idea with these words. What can wash away my sin? And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. In the final section of our passage this morning, we're going to look at verses 8 through 11. And here, Paul boldly declares his confidence in Christ alone. Paul boldly declares his confidence in Christ alone. Look at these verses. He says, What is more, or even more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. In these last few verses, Paul makes an even stronger, even bolder declaration about casting aside credentials and achievements. What is more, he said, even more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Paul utterly rejected any and all confidence in his pedigree, in his prominence, any kind of performance, It was like cargo tossed over the side of a ship during a shipwreck. Paul has jettisoned and cast aside every honor and achievement and trophy that formerly earned him favor and respect. He cast it all aside in order to gain Christ and know him. And when Paul says, I want to know Christ, he doesn't mean that he wants to know some facts and figures have a little bit of doctrine in his head, not at all. Paul is talking about having an intimate, personal, experiential knowledge of Jesus. Let the Judaizers have their regulations. Let them have their achievements. Paul wants only one thing. I want the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. And then Paul says it again. He says, I consider them rubbish, my, these achievements and credentials. I consider it rubbish. And that word rubbish is a really, really strong word. When the Philippians read that in the letter in their church service for the first time, it most likely raised a few eyebrows and probably caused the women to put a hand over their mouth. It means filthy garbage, manure, and even human excrement. Paul uses this word intentionally because he wants to leave no doubt in anyone's mind about how strongly he is rejecting human achievement of any kind ever being added to the gospel. Don't ever add that to the gospel, Paul says. And just so you know, when Paul talks about his loss and giving it all up, Paul isn't mourning his loss. Not at all. He's actually, in a way, he's shouting, Good riddance, be gone. In a way, Paul is saying, you know, before I met Jesus, I was in a spiritually blind condition and I actually thought all my achievements and credentials, I thought they were all precious treasures. But now, because the light of Christ 
has opened my eyes and I see things more clearly. It has been revealed to me that all of those things are rubbish, worthless garbage, and worse. This is why Paul said back in verse 1 that our rejoicing was to be in the Lord. Because when the gospel is clear, we rejoice in what Jesus has accomplished, not in anything that we have done. And we rejoice because in the Lord, we have received a gift that we never could have earned on our own. When we put our faith in Christ, we earn a gift that we never could have earned, or we receive a gift we never could have earned on our own. Look at what we gain. In verse 9, Paul says, we are found in Christ, receiving a righteousness, not because of my efforts, but rather from God by faith. When we put our faith in Christ, our sin and our guilt are transferred onto the shoulders of Jesus. And his perfect righteousness is transferred to us. This is what the Bible calls justification. And this exchange of my sin for his righteousness, that exchange... uh, That exchange puts us in right standing with God. I am justified. But Paul says there's more. In verse 10, he says, we grow daily in our knowledge of Christ, this personal, intimate, experiential knowledge of him. And Paul says, I want that more than anything. And we experience the power of his resurrection. The scripture says the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us, enabling us to live renewed and regenerated lives. That's God's work in you. Friends, he's giving you the ability to will and to act according to his good purpose. Remember that from verse 13 in the previous chapter? He gives you the will and the ability to act. And Paul said in chapter one, he who started that work will be faithful to complete it. And one more, in verse, uh, he says, and further we experience the, the fellowship of suffering, the fellowship of his sufferings. This happens as we live for him, as we live for Jesus and serve him, and we suffer for the ministry of the gospel. And we become like him in his death, Paul says. Just as Jesus died for our sin once for all, so also we must take up our cross and die to our sin each day. And in that way, we become like him in his death. This, friends, is what the Bible calls sanctification. It's the process of becoming more and more like Christ day by day. And finally, in verse 11, Paul says, And somehow I want to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul often described the Christian life as a marathon, a race to be run. And Paul would run to win the prize, determined never to quit or be disqualified. And he wants to reach the finish line, what he calls here the resurrection of the dead. That's the finish line. This is what the Bible calls glorification, our final rest in the presence of God. So Paul has set aside every trophy, every achievement, every credential, every honor. He's rejected them as rubbish and in exchange. He has received a righteousness that is found only in Christ. And in doing so, he has gained far, far more than he lost. He gained treasures with eternal value. He has been justified. He is being sanctified. And he will be glorified someday. Let me close our message this morning by asking you a question. When you think about standing before the Lord someday, because every single one of us will, when you think about standing before the Lord, what are you trusting in? What is your confidence in? Because everybody puts their confidence in something. But what about you? Will you stand, when you stand before the Lord someday, are you going to bring a duffel bag that's full of trophies and awards and a a list of achievements? Going to bring a duffel bag with you? Hoping to kind of show off what you have done? Or will you stand before the Lord with empty hands? With empty hands, trusting only in the righteousness of Christ. 
In that first case with the duffel bag, you will bring all kinds of treasure with you, but you will wind up with nothing. Turned away with the words, depart from me. I never knew you. But if you come with empty hands, if you bring nothing, you will be given eternal treasure and you will be welcomed into heaven with the words, well done, good and faithful servant. This is a choice that every single one of us must make and we have to make it in this life. And if you have not done so already, I just want to urge you, like the Apostle Paul, ditch the duffel bag. Let go of the trophies and awards and credentials and achievements and put your faith in Christ alone for the salvation of your soul. Why don't we stand together for closing prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for the text that you have provided through your Holy Spirit, through inspiration. We are so grateful for Paul's teaching, for your truth that is communicated so clearly. God, I pray that there would be none of us in this room, none within the sound of my voice, that would continue to hold on, hoping that their performance and achievements will somehow earn their way into heaven someday. God, I pray that we would all ditch the duffel bag and just let it all go. And God, I pray that you would give us courage and the faith to put our trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, that, the, that Jesus' death and resurrection all by itself, Jesus plus nothing, is what we need to be saved. May that be true of every person in this room. Help us to trust only in Christ. And Jesus, we pray this morning and thank you for your sacrifice that though being in very nature God, you did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made yourself nothing. And you became human and, and took on the very nature of a servant and became obedient to the Father's will to the point of death, even death on the cross. And Jesus, we just want to thank you for that, uh, for that sacrifice that you made on our behalf. We are so blessed and we embrace it by faith this morning. May we continue to become the people that you desire us to be. May your truth reign in our hearts. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm.